Thanks so much, Sabine. Um, it's really great to be here with all of you. Um, I apologize in advance if I start coughing. I'm getting over bronchitis, um, but I, I'm mostly better. Antibiotics are a wonderful thing. Um, so I'm going to talk today about modeling neuropsychiatric disorders in the laboratory. And as Sabine mentioned, you know, why sex matters and maybe why we still have a little bit um, more to do in this in this area, particularly as preclinical researchers. So just a little bit about where I'm going to go today. So according to the World Health Organization, in 2019, one in eight people, or 970 million people worldwide, were living with a neuropsychiatric disorder. This, the majority of these individuals suffer from either an anxiety disorder, um, those include things like phobias, uh, social disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, post-traumatic stress disorder, which is uh, my primary area of study, uh, as well as generalized anxiety disorder um, or a depressive disorder. Um, and those, are, you know, as, as obvious are, are things like major depressive disorder. In addition, recent estimates have determined that the COVID-19 pandemic has significantly increased the prevalence of these disorders. There's been a lot of talk about that in the United States and as well as in Europe. Um, and these increases are by as much as 26 and 28% for anxiety and depressive disorders, respectively. I think that only time is really going to be able to tell us how the pandemic has really shifted the long-term prevalence of all mental health disorders. Um, but you can see that the, I think it's already obvious in the short amount of time that we've had that there is a, a significant shift in, in the prevalence, as well as how people are kind of thinking and talking about it. Um, the burden of neuropsychiatric disorders is also incredibly high. Um, in terms of disability adjusted life years, these conditions now cause one in five years lived with disability and are ranked seventh overall in the share of total disease burden worldwide. They're also a significant cause of premature death, shortening an individual's life by up to two decades in some cases. The link between neuropsychiatric disorders and suicide is also incredibly well documented. Not all suicide or suicide attempts can be directly attributed to an underlying neuropsychiatric disorder. Um, as, as the data shows, there's not a direct relationship between having a, new, a neuropsychiatric disorder and suicide. But suicide remains a significant public health concern. It's something, you know, in my role uh, dealing with veterans, um, it's a significant concern. It's the 16th leading cause of death uh, and accounts for 1.3% of all deaths. It's particularly high among 15 to 29 year olds, um, where it's the second leading cause of death. Um, and is also incredibly high among, you know, very specific groups like veterans, as, as I mentioned. Um, while we cannot eliminate all suicides, we do know that if we treat the underlying condition, we make a significant impact on the under, uh, on the suicide rates worldwide. So how does sex factor in here? Um, when we look at neuropsychiatric disorders as a whole, males and females largely show similar levels of prevalence, um, with females showing a slight advantage um, in the most recent data from 2019. But when we look at the differences between males and females among individual disorders, we see sex-specific patterns, with some neuropsychiatric disorders showing uh, a more a higher female predominance. Um, those include things like depression, eating disorders, and anxiety disorders. Others show a more male dominance. Um, ADHD is probably the most well-known one with a male dominance. And others show, uh, you know, fairly equal rates among males and females. So thinking about, you know, which disorder we're talking about is, is important when we consider, you know, how much sex is an influence. When we look more closely, um, we see that in addition to differences in prevalence, the global burden of different neuropsychiatric diseases also varies by sex and across different age groups. 
Um, and this data, which is from 2019, you can see that women disproportionately bear the burden of many neuropsychiatric diseases across the lifespan. And this is particularly relevant for depressive disorders and anxiety disorders, which are shown in this red. Women and men also differ in disease presentation. Um, so for example, women are twice as likely as males to have a single major depressive disorder episode and four times as likely as males to have recurrent MDD. This sex difference in MDD incidence may be driven by the fact that women are more likely to seek treatment than men are, um, but because it's ubiquitously observed across different cultures, underlying biological differences are definitely at play here. Um, comparing males and females with major depressive disorder, females tend to have more symptoms. They tend to have higher symptom severity. They also tend to report more subjective distress and are more likely to have comorbid conditions such as anxiety disorder. Males are more likely to have comorbid substance use disorder, so there is a little bit of balance there. Um, although this is more controversial, um, there is some data that suggests that there are sex differences in antidepressant treatment resp response, with some studies showing that for MAOIs and selective serotonin uptake inhibitors, they're more may be more effective in female patients, whereas males might be more responsive to tricyclic antidepressants and ketamine. Psychotherapy also seems to have a similar effect in males and females, but women are much more likely to engage in psychotherapy than males are. Taken together, this is just one example that suggests that we must be more proactive in studying sex influences on the outcomes of patients that have the different neuropsychiatric disorders. Unfortunately, uh, you know, this, this, I can speak to, to the US, but this you know, kind of applies broadly across the world. Um, women have been historically excluded from clinical trials because of the fear of liability associated with birth defects um, in pregnant women, um, the misconception that there's just no fundamental differences between males and females outside of reproduction. Um, you know, when women are included, they're often included in very specific subsets. So most women have to be taking birth control uh, to be included in clinical trials. Um, in the United States, up until 1993, um, the most of the research conducted across the board for health-related research was conducted in males only. Um, the assumption that male data could be easily extrapolated to females set a really dangerous present, precedent. And as a result, many fundamental differences between males and females were largely overlooked. Um, fortunately, by the end of the 20th century, this perspective started to shift. Uh, and Congress passed the National Institutes of Health Revitalization Act of 1993, which mandated the inclusion of women and minorities in NIH-funded clinical trials. That same year, the FDA also uh, changed its policy that required women to be included in safety and dosing studies, and similar policies were also enacted in Europe around the same time period. So we're here kind of because I think, you know, we have a strong interest in preclinical science. Um, so this common bias was carried over to preclinical research as well. Researchers have consistently argued that results for male animals, cells, and tissues uh, would apply equally to females. Um, they also have argued, you know, I remember this during my time as a graduate student, that hormone cycles decrease the, you know, increase the variability of your study population, making the data so uninterpretable because you can't figure out how to, how to really manage this variability. Um, the guidance that we had in clinical research, it would take 20 years before similar guidance was enacted by the NIH that, that mandated consideration of sex as a biological variable in preclinical research, but it's just that. 
the, the policy only states that researchers must consider sex as a biological variable. It does not mandate that females are included. Um, and as a result of that, most preclinical research is still conducted in only males. Um, this is data from a 2016 meta-analysis that shows that only 21% of all animal studies even reported the sex of the animals, let alone included the sex. Um, you know, so you can see there's kind of some variability across different disease areas with some, I think, doing a better job than others. But by and large, we're, we've still got a long way to go. What does this lack of inclusion mean for patient outcomes? So why does this really even matter? Um, as I mentioned earlier, females show a higher incidence of most anxiety disorders, um, including post-traumatic stress. Um, PTSD is a condition that shows an incredibly high lifetime prevalence in, in women especially. Women are more than twice as likely than men to get PTSD. It's a condition that, that occurs after experiencing or witnessing a, a traumatic event. Um, and it includes a, you know, a number of different symptoms that are outlined in the DSM, including things like re-experiencing, cognitive dysfunction, um, spanning across a number of different domains. Um, See, I already written it, wrote it, written that on there. Um, but it shows fairly clear and predictable sex differences between males and females. And there are even some sex differences between even the presentation of how PTSD um, occurs in males and females. Changes in the HPA axis are strongly associated with PTSD symptomology. Males and females have well-documented differences in response to acute and repeated stress. Uh, males, uh, females typically have a more robust HPA response following exposure to a number of different types of acute stressors. Um, this is evidenced by increased levels of corticosterone and increased levels of ACTDH. Um, sex differences at each different each level of the HPA axis, as well as in other limbic structures that regulate activation of the HPA axis, such as the amygdala likely underlie these differences between males and females. Um, the expression of different HPA axis related genes also differs between males and females. Um, you see differences in mRNA expression of vasopressin and CRH in the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. They also show differences in mRNA expression of the ACTH precursor, POMC, in the anterior pituitary following acute stress compared with males. In, a different, in addition to differences in activation, there's also differences in being able to shut off this HPA axis. Um, so males and females show not, not only a difference in that response, act, the response activation, uh, but females also show a delayed return to baseline um, after exposure to an acute stressor, indicated by sex differences in glucocorticoid-mediated HPA-negative feedback. These differences may be due to underlying differences in glucocorticoid receptor activation in the limbic structures that are known to inhibit the HPA axis. As females show both lower glucocorticoid binding in the hypothalamus, as well as a lower density of both types of glucocorticoid receptors in the pituitary compared to males. Changes in HPA function may also fluctuate across the estrus cycle. Studies have shown that estradiol levels increase during proestrus in female rats. Basal and stress-induced activity of the HPA axis also is increased. For example, female rodents in diestrus, which is characterized by very low estradiol levels, show similar resting glucocorticoid secretion and similar HPA on-off response to stress as males. But by proestrus, which is characterized by high estradiol levels and progesterone levels, and estrus, which occurs just following the peak of estradiol, females exhibit higher basal and stress-induced ACTH and corticosterone levels. 
the highest level of HPA output are observed on pro-estrous morning when estradiol levels are at their peak, but elevations in progesterone have not yet occurred yet. Female rats in proesterous and estrus also show a delayed return to baseline glucocorticoid stress following stress, glucocorticoid levels following stress. So how does all of this relate to stress-related anxiety disorders such as PTSD? Our ability to adapt to acute stressors is evolutionarily advantageous. Um, it allows us to mobilize resources when necessary when we need to survive. But chronic or repeated exposure to stressors can drive constant act activation of the HPA axis, which is detrimental, as most of us know, um, and leads to an increased risk of disease, particularly diseases such as PTSD and other anxiety disorders. Um, although there are many challenges that are outside the scope of today's presentation, animal models currently hold the best promise for being able to elucidate the underlying mechanisms of many neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, and a number of different animal models are out there to study the potential therapeutic strategy and, and underlying processes of these disorders. These are just some of the ones that, that um, I could think of. Um, but when I look at this list of, of different models, with the exception of one or two, females were largely omitted from the development of these animal models and their use to assess potential therapeutics. Um, you know, when we exclude females from all of the all of the work that goes into creating and refining the models, um, you, you know, we we lose a lot of the important second half of, of the story um, in understanding how these models really translate to the human condition. One in particular that I'm going to talk about is the single prolonged stress model. So for those that aren't aware of this model, the single prolonged stress uh, paradigm is one of the most widely employed models for studying PTSD related symptoms in rodents and has been used to model a variety of different aspects of human pathology, including anxiety, uh, depression, hyperarousal, reduced social behavior, uh, impaired fear extinction is, a, is, is a, a big one, impaired cognition as well, um, as well as looking at some of the underlying mechanism, things like molecular changes in the HPA axis, um, changes in the noradrenergic system, um, and it's widely used by pharmaceutical companies to evaluate pharmacological interventions. It's a really convenient model for a, for a pharmaceutical company because it's fairly succinct, it's fairly short. Um, the animals are uh, sequentially exposed to three stressors, uh, two hours of restraint, a 20 minute group swim, and then exposure to an ether until loss of consciousness. Um, so it's it's really tight. It's very convenient if you're if you're in in pharma. Um, however, um, we did an analysis of this procedure, looking at kind of the methodological variation in the use and conduct of the model, um, basically since its inception um, through to 2020 when we did the analysis. And we found that only two studies that have ever used SPS and published with SPS results have included females, um, essentially meaning that females have been largely excluded from all of the research um, with this model, which is the highly sought, off, sought out model for drug companies looking to develop neuropsychiatric compounds. Even beyond the models used to mimic PTSD conditions, there are a number of issues in how we measure outcomes as well in you know, males and females. So similar to the models itself, most of the behavioral tests were designed using only males. Um, as you can see from this review, uh, from you know, two individuals that are you know, really well versed in this area, um, a number of the actual mo models to measure the outcomes actually shows very specific sex differences. So for example, the open field shows greater 
greater outcomes in males versus females. Um, light dark box shows greater greater outcomes in males versus females. Um, you know, just across the board, everything that we can think of to measure various symptomology of, of, of PTSD and other neuropsychiatric disorders shows male-female differences. Um, interpreting animal behavior in the lab really requires considering both what the situation you've placed the animal means to them, as well as how their response reflects differences in the needs of each sex, um, so differences between males and females. So one, one well-documented example is how males and females respond to fear. Um, fear conditioning, I'm sure all of you are very familiar with, it's regularly employed to measure an animal's fear response. Um, it's also one of the most widely used outcome measures in the SPS PTSD model. Um, it's consistently shown as a benchmark for whether or not the model worked. Um, in the typical rodent fear conditioning task, animals are presented with a tone paired with a slight electric shock to the foot. This pairing normally induces a fear response that is then measured by fear behavior, freezing behavior. Um, but Rebecca Shansky's lab proved that females also show fear uh, using another behavior. And this behavior she termed darting. Um, it's a brief kind of high velocity movement. It's sort of hard to describe unless you see it. So I, I invite people to kind of YouTube what darting looks like. Um, her lab found that approximately 40% of females exhibit darting after fear conditioning, whereas most males displayed the kind of typical freezing behavior that people think about in response to fear conditioning, with only 10% of males exhibiting any darting behavior. Um, both of the behaviors can be extinguished over time, and females that darted exhibited better extinction memory than non-darters. Darters Darting was not associated with the estrus cycle, while freezing-based extinction in females was better during pro-estrus when estrogen levels are higher. Um, they also have done some mechanistic studies and shown that males show morphology, morphology changes in the prefrontal amygdala circuitry, but females did not even did not, even though both sex kind of split into these high and low freezing groups. So there was the, the underlying morpho changes in, in the brain were not the same between males and females, despite what their behavior output looked like. Um, the point of this is, is that when you compare females to a male st standard for outcome behavior, um, you might in unintentionally interpret the results as a sex differences when the females might just be employing a very different behavior to cope with their environment. So I think um, many people have seen this uh, picture before. Um, you know, it's the, the drug development process is long and very expensive. Um, depending on the therapeutic area, the time to take a new drug target through to FDA approval or, you know, regulatory approval can take anywhere between nine and 15 years. Um, and the average estimated cost of this is between one and 2.6 billion US dollars. Um, in the end, only one compound in every five to 10,000 actually gains FDA approval. Um, there are a lot of reasons why drugs fail to reach the market. Um, we spent a lot of time in the preclinical data network uh, discussing all of the reasons why drugs fail to make it, particularly in CNS. Um, but one of the most prominent reasons is really the quality of the preclinical research that the therapeutic is based on. Um, and this includes things like the robustness and level of validation of the experimental findings as well as the predictive power of the animal model. Um, in the context of sex as a biological variable, the limited inclusion and also reporting of sex-specific effects in preclinical research, um, as, long, as well as the lack of validated animal models for diseases with known mechanistic and phenotypic differences between males and females, really limits investments by the pharmaceutical industry into sex-specific treatments um, and kind of further decreases 
their interest in the neuropsychiatric field altogether. We've, we kind of see that by and large where uh, most of the, the drugs for most neuropsychiatric conditions were developed quite some time ago because the pharmaceutical industry has largely abandoned this area. Um, because many preclinical studies kind of poorly address internal validity threats, fail attempts at replication, aren't published at all, um, or provide exaggerated estimates of clinical utility, um, there's been a lot of urging in sort of how we conduct preclinical research, um, wanting us to sort of think about all the ways that we can improve how preclinical research is done um, and, and make a move towards more precision psychiatry for, for a number of these conditions. Um, to over kind of come the, the many challenges of current animal model strategies, um, you know, we have to kind of think about, you know, changing, changing how we how we think about these models in general. So in, in general, most preclinical models of neuropsychiatric disorders are based on a kind of a simple principle. Let's, let's really scare an animal and see how it reacts. Um, but we, we don't really understand, uh, kind of fully understand how PTSD works in particular, but you know, kind of across the board, we don't understand the underlying neurobiological mechanisms of all of these diseases. Um, and disease presentation is, is incredibly heterogeneous. Um, but most importantly, I think, you know, despite what we know about these conditions and their differences in prevalence and, and presentation and burden, we have a long way to go towards fully incorporating studying sex differences in preclinical research at a level that really reflects the true clinical population. So how will the inclusion of sex as a biological variable enhance preclinical and in turn clinical research? Um, so first at the experimental design stage, intentional study design at the outset to determine whether there are sex differences in a particular area of study will allow researchers to be able to develop hypotheses accordingly and randomize and balance the sexes across experimental groups. Studying outcome measures separately in each sex could lead to better interpretation of treatment effects more broadly and could also inform the design of additional tests and tools to that consider fundamental differences between males and females. Third, in the analysis stage, by disaggregating data by sex, you can reveal sex differences that are often hidden when pooling data from males and females together to establish whether there is a sex difference from a potential treatment. And then finally, at the reporting stage, if we improve the reporting of sex of the animals, as well as the cells and tissues that are used in different types of preclinical research, it will inform others in their research and allow more research researchers to pursue fruitful avenues of sex differences research, regardless of, of whether we're using animal models or cells and tissues. So sort of in response to um, all of the issues of preclinical research and incorporation of sex as a biological variable, a number of years ago um, through an NIH grant, we, uh, myself and a number of colleagues, um, developed a, a series of training videos um, that looks at not just some of the basic underlying differences uh, between males and females across preclinical research, kind of some of the known knowns that we know about where there are differences between males and females, but as well as how to practically incorporate um, animals of both sexes in preclinical research. So we created a number of different videos, there are 18 in total, 
Um, they review everything from the fundamentals of sex differences in brain and behavior to practical recommendations for including both sexes into your experiments, um, things like housing considerations, how and when to track hormones, um, statistical analyses that are disaggregated by sex, as well as study design for either intentional or non-intentional study of sex differences. And then some studies, uh, some of the, you know, basic overview of some sex differences in pharmacology as well. This is, I think, sometimes an, an underappreciated um, area um, where we don't necessarily think about simple things like sex differences in anesthesia uh, use uh, in, in, in small animal surgery. Um, all of the videos are online. Um, they include an, uh, an accompanying annotated script, which has a reference list for each video um, and shows you kind of where we where we sourced all the material from. So if you want to dive deeper into the material further than than we were able to do in a in short five to ten minute videos, um, you're able to do so. Um, and uh, this is kind of just a, a a little bit about what what is contained in each of these modules. Um, and then, you know, these are kind of who who we used uh, as our scientific advisory board. So kind of the, the brains behind uh, the creation of these videos. And then again, you know, as, as um, Sabine mentioned, um, you know, we are both the co-chairs of the Global Preclinical Data Forum. Uh, the, sex as a biological variable is just kind of one of the areas of, of interest for this uh, group of, of revolutionists who are trying to change the preclinical research area and, and uh, inspire people to create better data quality in this preclinical space. Um, so I, I, I certainly invite you to, to contact either one of us about this and, and figure out how you can get involved. Um, we're a passionate group who, who really enjoy this area. And that's all for me. I can take any questions from anybody. Thank you 